I'm really uh, honored to chair this um, panel today with uh, very distinguished speakers. Uh, I may be a bit tired at this moment because I woke up at 3 a.m. this morning to arrive here from Sarajevo. Uh, but I'm really glad to be here after almost four years uh, of being away from Kusek, so it's also quite emotional uh, for me. Um, so our uh, title, uh, or the title, the panel today will deal with the uh, region of uh, ex-Yugoslavia, right? So the topic of the panel is what have we learned from the war and disintegration of Yugoslavia? facing the challenges of nationalism, fragmentation, and all-out war in Europe. Uh, so, uh, as, um, as I think that we will do, and this is obviously going to depend uh, on the speakers themselves and how they want to approach the topic, but we will deal with these issues of uh, nationalism, um, ethnic uh, hatreds, and on challenges of living in multi-ethnic societies with regards to like a larger European project and maybe uh, with some kind of references to what is currently uh, going on in the wider uh, European continent also, but especially or maybe to a certain degree in Ukraine itself. Uh, so uh, I will introduce speakers, uh, basically uh, not all at once, but uh, as they will be speaking. Uh, so I will give uh, each of them uh, 12 minutes. Uh, after this, I will give them this uh, warning, uh, just like uh, Rubin did uh, a panel ago. So um, first uh, speaker for today will be uh, Jody uh, Jensen. There is uh, a lot to say about her, but I will try to stay very brief, obviously. Uh, so basically, uh, Jody Jensen is the director of transdisciplinary research and collaboration at IASC. Uh, she's a senior, senior research fellow at the Institute of Political Sciences at the Hungarian Ac Academy of Sciences, and many other things. Uh, but I think it's not necessary to go into this right now, but maybe better to give floor to Jody. Thank you so much, Igor. It's so good to see you. Um, I, my job today actually is to take you to the past. Um, I had uh, written a report um, years and years ago, I'll explain it to you, um, that just kind of came to the surface when one of our archivists found it this year. Um, as you all recall, um, the kind of official date of the start of the war in Yugoslavia was June 26, 1991, with Slovenia's declaration. Um, about 10 days later, July 7, 1991, a meeting was organized in Belgrade by Sonja Licht under the auspices of the Helsinki Citizens Assembly in order to bring people um, from both the inside and outside of Yugoslavia to discuss the crisis and the wars. And so um, we had representatives from Serbs, Croats, Slovenians, Bosnians, Macedonians, representatives from Vojvodina and Kosovo, and from outside of Yugoslavia, people came from England, France, Germany, the US, Holland, Italy, Romania, Hungary, Canada, Estonia, and Poland. And this was the only meeting of its kind before all war broke out. And it was organized miraculously in five days um, in order to confront the daily loss of lives. So I wanted to give you a little bit of a, a picture about what went on in that meeting and what lessons we can maybe take from th those discussions um, into um, contemporary context. The first professor to speak was um, Milo, and you will recognize many of these names, um, Milo Van Gilash, the writer and dissident. And he began by saying that Europe was not prepared for the fall of the Berlin Wall, and that European integration only became problematic with the reintegration of, of, of Germany which was really not at all, has not really at all been discussed. And that created a vacuum in European security and state nationalist elites rose to ruling the republics in Yugoslavia. Economic conflicts became political conflicts which in turn escalated into violent ethnic conflicts. And Gilash believed that um, there must be a real economic solution to the crisis and the creation of a demilitarized zones and integration and a central European security union. Um, Milan Nikolic, the president of the Social Democratic Party in Serbia, said that the major causes of the rise in nationalism were the historic desire for nation building, unresolved historic conflicts, totalitarian tendencies in the old and new leaders, who he said were all ex-communists in some way, and he suggested that um, the rational solution would consist of taking the path of lesser evil, which we had, would be to just stop arming, um, shipping armaments to Yugoslavia and calling for an immediate ceasefire, fire, sending in monitoring groups because no one could trust the accuracy of the reports that were 
being reported in the press. He said there should be talks about the future of Yugoslavia, which should be conducted at the UN Security Council level. And he re reiterated um, Gilash's point that an international peacekeeping force should be established in the region. Um, Dusan Janjic from the Forum for Ethnic Reconciliation said what was happening in Yugoslavia is only the most extreme form of ethnic conflict that exists in the wider region of East and Central Europe, and that the fall of communism was used to incite nationalism. Yugoslavia, he said, will shake up the rest of Europe and Western countries and cannot be, and Western countries cannot remain outside the Yugoslav conflict. If the conflict cannot be contained, then we are going to face war between states, he said, Serbia and Croatia, religious wars in Bosnia and Herzegovina, and wars in the international environment. And he suggested some form of federa confederation with the help of the United States and Soviet Union. Um, a representative from the European movement in Bosnia, Zdravko Grebo, began with the question, is Yugoslavia desirable? And he questioned even the need for international mediation because he said, if we can't talk to each other, then there's no need for mediation. He said Yugoslavia was like a washing machine that had been turned out, but the person that had been turned on, but the person who turned the machine on has left the room and the only possibility is to switch off the power so that it stops. And he said that the Muslims in Bosnia and Herzegovina had organized and established a political platform and were already arming. He said Bosnia cannot exist without Yugoslavia, and if Bosnia falls, then Yugoslavia falls. In Macedonia, um, said Dimitar Mircev from the Reformist Party, people didn't feel the crisis, but that was, of course, later contradicted by someone from the Albanian minority in Macedonia. He said that, you know, Macedonia doesn't have such a drive towards statehood because it simply cannot support the establishment of a military force in Macedonia, which would secure its borders. So they don't really have such a, they didn't have at that time such a problem with their own sovereignty. Um, he said that institutions should be established within communities that represent minority and ethnic interests, and special institutions for conflict resolu resolution should be organized. Tibor Varady from the Hungarian, um, a Hungarian from the Yugoslav Democratic Initiative in Vojvodina, said that although the time was ripe for the fall of communism, so society was not prepared to offer alternatives. He said national symbols have become increasingly potent and we have to move to desacralize them. He said there's a concentration on the heroic past that has led to the creation of the images of hero and demon. He said there are no men anymore, so the taboo against killing a fellow human being is transgressed. He said we need specific, not general standards for minorities, and for this we need the help from Europe. You will hear this help from Europe as a kind of continuing refrain from, from these representatives. Vitan Suroy, the leader of the parliamentary party in Kosovo, had only been released from jail two days earlier. He was arrested in Kosovo for organizing a peace rally centered around the burial of an empty coffin, which symbolized the burial of violence in Kosovo. When authorities in Belgrade found out about his arrest and sentencing to 60 days, he was released after a day and a half, but not soon enough to avoid the humiliation of having his head shaved. He was impressive in his eloquence and conciliatory manner. He said that democracy, or so-called free elections, had brought about new totalitarianism. In fact, he said, one-fifth of Yugoslavia had no free elections at all. So we can't speak about the existence of democracy in Yugoslavia today or then. He said that the Serbian national issue, it is actually the Serbian national issue, issue which is in conflict with all other interpreters of national issues. You don't see, for example, he said, conflicts between Croats and Macedonians, Slovenes and Albanians. He believed that the nation state can exist with minorities and that the nation state can be uh, protection against hegemony. Mladen Lazic from the Social Democratic League in Croatia explained that the problems of the region were only avoided after Second World War and we are now paying the price. He said surveys conducted in Croatia revealed that people do accept totalitarian forms of behavior, and we are now witnessing the emergence of proto-totalitarian states in Yugoslavia. The political leadership in the, Republic in, in the republics, he said, are only able to survive in conflict situations, not in peaceful situations surrounding negotiation. Therefore, they are deeply rooted in and dependent upon the maintenance of conflict. That was kind of the morning session. 
uh, the recognition that the Yugoslav crisis is a European crisis and that everyone, East and West, is responsible. And if we don't do something now, then we will be paying the price sooner or later, regionally, but also in terms of Western European integration. What's most Im um, impressive about these discussions were the, was their seriousness and rationality. There were no outbursts from extreme nationalists who hadn't actually been invited, um, invited to the meeting because they were afraid um, of what might happen. But we did have a lot of security risks. And so the organizers the night before proposed several alternative locations for the meeting if we were disrupted in any way. Um, you, can't even, you, you have to feel the tensions in, the, in that room. Um, at, at, during those moments. Um, what was also impressive was the fact that people came from all parts of Yugoslavia. They left their families behind. They were facing a 12 a.m. ultimatum decline, uh, deadline and were unsure whether they would be able to return to their homes and their families. Um, people traveled home to Kosovo in the dark through, so through mountains and Serbian troops and battles to be able to speak to each other and to the outside world about the crisis that they were living in, um, which threatened their families and their future. In the afternoon, the floor was left open to people from outside of Yugoslavia, and the first contribution was made by Ernst Gellner. He delineated his five stages of development of nationalism, which I'm not going to go into, and he also delineated um, a new paradigm approach to the four time zones in Europe, which I don't want to get into either. Um, some of his conclusions, however, were that national self-determination is rubbish because self-determination for A means it's denial for B and C and ends in murder and the forced movements of people. National self-determination was the focus of the discussions from really there on in in the afternoon. Um, Western experience, um, he said, uh, proved that self-determination was no guarantee for the protection of minority rights and that the only guarantee for minority rights was the larger framework of human rights to safeguard um, all the rights. Um, he said that the region of East Central Europe, um, there is a drive for nation building today that takes precedence over any other forms of civil engagement and development. I will skip over some of these less interesting people. Um, Professor Bronislav Jeremek was there and said that the Yugoslav concerns are European concerns, especially for post-communist societies like Poland. The future in Europe, he said, depends on the peaceful solution of the Yugoslav crisis, and he mentioned the importance of a new Marshall Plan for East and Central Europe. Yugoslavia, he said, must be seen as an integral part of European security and stability. The future of Europe and the future of Yugoslavia cannot be determined by an agreement reached between the United States and the Soviet Union. He said, this is first of all a European program problem and the status quo cannot be supported. Jedemek continued that the mixture of civil war and war um, in Yugoslavia um, has no UN solution. And for the first time, the CSCE and the Helsinki process could give proof to their effic efficacy. And action should be taken by both the institutions and by civil society in the form of public debates. He said the public debate is very badly informed and the crisis has to be seen in the context of European in integration. The West is co-responsible for making of this crisis. He said the European community can immediately offer more than just economic solutions. There should be a new structural union in Yugoslavia, which includes the representation of all groups. Um, he concluded by saying that the most important thing was time. He said we needed time to discover solutions, but of course we found out that there was no time left. Um, Gert Weiskirchen, a member of the Jum uh, German Bundestag, said that Yugoslavia is a test case for Europe as a whole, and Europe is strong enough to help Yugoslavia out of the crisis if it wants to. If it does not take action, it will be a great mistake, and the ensuing bloodshed will affect all of us. Weiskirchen assured everyone that there was no tension in Germany to exploit the Yugoslav situation in terms of Germany becoming a new, old, hegemonic power in the region. And this was very much in people's minds at that point. Because the fear was expressed by many people outside and inside the meeting that Germany would take over and play a new role um, in Eastern Central Europe and in, in, the, in the Western Balkans. 
um, because most of the hopes on Western economic aid for the regions were dependent upon um, Germany for economic aid. And at the same time, this aid um, was subconsciously um, pr um, projecting an increased German influence in the region. Even the fact that he had to come out and say something like that meant that that was also um, in his mind. Adam Michnik began by saying that Europe is, by its very nature, multicultural, ethnic, and religious. And he said, we have seen communism with a xenophobic face, and now we see anti-communism with a Bolshevik face. Um, uh, he believes that Bosnia and Herzegovina will be determinant in the Yugoslav situation. And he said, he asked, will we see another Sarajevo in Europe? So it was important um, for everyone present that both Geremek and Mishnik felt that the Yugoslav crisis was so pressing and personal that they left a parliamentary session to attend the meeting in Belgrade. And actually the presence of all of the people from the outside of Yugoslavia was extremely important for the Yugoslavs themselves because they felt that they uh, needed um, and they had, had felt pressure to communicate with the uh, um, outside world. There was tension, exhaustion, uncertainty, and fear that were tangibly present as people tried to cope with the terror and loss that they were experiencing. Um, so Miranda Anahi said that she was afraid that um, th we can not mitigate the situation, we can only try to limit the number of victims. Um, there, I just want to mention one other person before I conclude. Konstantin Gebert from Poland was critical, hard, and effective. He said, from the Serbs we have heard today, help us or you will have war. From the non-Serbs we hear, live up to your principles and recognize our right to self-determination or you will have war. What possibilities did Europe actually have here? And I remember that as the quintessential moment. They were all saying, you give us what we want or we will have war. There was not any um, place, any room for dialogue or compromise. Um, there were concrete suggestions that were made, including mediation by the European Community and CSCE, organization of a Balkans conference, inter uh, international level discussions of fundamental human rights, um, to be able to desert from the armed services in a, um, in a civil conflict, um, condemnation of the arms trade to Yugoslavia, and we have to engage ourselves in a countervailing media campaign, um, maybe producing a weekly monitor of what's happening, even if report, reports were conflicting, at least something um, from the ground would be coming out and it should be distributed between Yugoslavia and throughout Europe. Um, um, as I w mentioned at the beginning, um, the meeting was carried out in a serious and rational manner, although tragedy of what was occurring was always not far from the surface. We all left the meeting in tears. A man from Yugosl the Yugoslav Forum for Ethnic Reconciliation wept as he said, I am Slovenian, my grandmother Croatian by my grandfather, and Serbian by my wife and children. I no longer have a home I can return to. I wonder if that's the kind of world we're going to be living, leaving our children and grandchildren now. So I hope that some of these lessons and some of the uh, insights of the people that were at that meeting over 30 years ago can resonate with us today in the conflicts that we're facing now in Europe. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Jody, for this uh, both inspiring and emotional reflection. Um, as I think we should really take note of what uh, Jody was saying in terms of like Yugoslavia being most extreme form of something that can happen anywhere in the world and that's probably happening uh, as we are speaking right now and the relation between uh, Yugoslavia and Europe and you know the wider context inside of something that is happening uh, and the, the notion of the shared responsibility that we have as you know citizens of not only EU but the world itself. So thank you very much Jody. Now I would like to pass the word to another IASC person here, um, Ivana Stepanovic. Uh, please uh, take the floor. Thank you so much, Igor, and thank you, Jody, for this uh, for this story and uh, sharing all of this. For me, it's a very emotional issue because, as I said during the lunch, I was born in Yugoslavia, and then uh, when I was 12 years old, then I all, all of a sudden woke up in my bed being uh, uh, not a Yugoslavian but a Serbian, and I was kind of forced to change identity, which I never kind of came terms uh, to terms with. 
Um, my story is about uh, a found document, a historic document that uh, has never been published to my knowledge. It is a declaration that could have saved Yugoslavia. So I'm going back to this document to show uh, some ideas from this declaration. I will be uh, picking out the m what I think are the most important points, which uh, can tell us how the history could have taken a different turn, but also some ideas in this declaration that are really global and could be uh, some kind of a bright, uh, bright, uh, <laughs> how to say, pointing towards some kind of a bright future of cooperation and living together. So uh, I just um, have one image in this uh, in this slide uh, show, and this is the declaration. It is uh, originally uh, this is the ori this is the document that was supposed to be adopted the at the 14th Congress which marked the end of Yugoslavia. This is where actually it became clear that uh, Yugoslavia will break apart and, and there were some people crying there as well. Because this is when it became clear that, that if Yugoslavia, that Yugoslavia will inevitably uh, break apart and that inevitably also meant war and everybody uh, at in that room they knew it uh, at, the co at the last uh, Congress of the... Um, uh, League of Communists of Yugoslavia. Uh, so I wanted first to start with how this declaration begins. And it's a very interesting uh, introduction to this, uh, uh, to this because it says that we only have one world. And it was, so the declaration was prepared uh, from, two, uh, from 1987 to 1989, and in 1989 it was never adopted, obviously, because everything fell apart. So some of the global implications, how this declaration began, uh, be, uh, started with the, the world is facing profound transformation, tor be, uh, torn between uh, developed and undeveloped technological and material advancements, and extreme poverty threatened by the environmental catastrophe. It was 1989 when this was said. A plethora of unresolved issues that are a threat to peace, with the new equilibrium of an economic and political forces emerges, especially in Europe, as uh, international understanding and uh, disarmament is advancing and socialist countries are undergoing great changes. Uh, we have only one world and it depends on all of us whether it will follow the path of peace, freedom, cooperation, development and solidarity or the path of extinction. And I think that it is pretty clear that we chose the path of extinction. And this is really globally, not just in Yugoslavia. So I just want to briefly mention the reforms, political reforms that could have taken place in Yugoslavia. If this had happened, uh, Yugoslavia would still be together. Uh, so, uh, the first was this breaking away from the authoritarian socialism and the introduction of the concept of democratic socialism, so based on democratic government, self but still self-management, self uh, then social justice, solidarity, respect for human rights and market economy. So, it's kind of a mix between uh, the socialist legacy and this new democratic uh, system which they wanted to introduce. So then, uh, of course, individual freedom and rights would be the basis of this society. So uh, freedoms and rights of a human as a... S sorry for this, this uh, translation was really a literal translation from Serbo-Croatian. <laughs> so um, I do intend to uh, give it a better polish in the future. Um, so this uh, human as a sovereign political subject, I'm going to go quickly because uh, ma time is slowly, uh, quickly melting. Political pluralism, free elections, democratic federalism, and this is maybe key why it didn't work because it meant that every former republic and um, uh, province should have had uh, autonomy and um, uh, which means that they are constitutive subjects of the, this federation, so all of them would be <laughs> responsible for their own development, so there wouldn't be some kind of centralized governance. I mean, uh, someone who is a better expert on this could... I'm just really uh, outlining what, uh, what, um, what I think are the key points, but <laughs> obviously interpretation of this is much more uh, complex, so I don't want to go into that. E some economic changes, uh, this is interesting protection against monopoly. I think pretty much this is what is is driving the environmental catastrophe. 
so, so this is interesting than economic e efficiency market economy, but with uh, this is very interesting, but with en environmental responsibility. This is what we don't have uh, now in the whole world, I think. So it's single Yugoslav market, but also integration into European uh, and global markets with, again, ethics of economic responsibility, rationality and reciprocity. Then education is uh, obviously very important. Federal units should be independent and responsible for their own economic development. Unfortunately, this never happens. So the legacy of socialism, uh, freedom of association, workers' units, uh, uh, ownership, so this, this would also be this division between three types of ownership. Then uh, new social policy, social security, reciprocity and solidarity within this market economy. This is the kind of the third way. So the responsibility is shared by the state, society and individuals. So it is neither the neoliberal, we are, we are to be blamed for the plastic straws and, and other things, but, but also the state and also the society as a whole. Then, um, equality among nations. So this is also the legacy of socialism. So there wouldn't be Serbs, Croats, Slovenes, Macedonians, uh, Albanians, but it would be our peoples, which is something that, <laughs> that I can imagine on the global level, and I just don't understand why we have this, uh, these problems today. Then the non-alignment, uh, then the non-alignment movement, which uh, they wanted to be modernized, and because it, they thought it's very important for this neo, uh, for. Uh, breaking away f with the uh, colonial times and also better coherence and so now uh, a little bit about integra integrations Yugoslavia should be a part of Europe recognition of the global problems again related to ecology ecology was always mentioned in the first place this is very interesting 1989 uh, ecology democracy technology uh, interestingly population uh, North-South relations, these problems lead us towards a new era of international relations which can no longer be based on the battle be of power between militarily and politically opposed blocks and systems, which we are now sliding back into. Uh, peace and international security are human rights of individuals, peoples and states which uh, being achieved only with, within the international community. And so uh, they, they said that they would like to approach United Europe as the union of differences. Poo. And finally, <laughs> another point about the environment, because for me it was the most fascinating that in this whole declaration I, find I found so much about environment. Um, the purpose and fate of humanity increasingly depends on environmental protection. The world has to take united efforts to stop the extinguish, extinction of natural environment to prevent the sliding into the abyss of self-destruction. The world requires balance between quantitative progress and what we now call the growth economy and quality of life where ecology holds priority. What have we done wrong, I'm wondering? when we had th those solutions in the beginning. So the right to healthy environment is one of the most important individual rights. And socialism, uh, they outlined this uh, concept of ecological movements, which would think globally and act locally. And they thought that throughout the, through this um, legacy of uh, unions and uh, uh, self-management, this socialism therefore offers some kind of uh, new idea how uh, ec environment, how, how um, these ecological movements could help us. So um, this democratic socialism therefore is quite interesting and I think it hasn't been explored enough and I think this is the final slide. So I, I, I ended up uh, before uh, uh, Igor clinked the glass. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Ivana. You're probably going to win in this category. So <laughs> it's a small but important victory for both you and me. Um, so thank you very much for your intervention. I don't know if I should say thank you for taking us on this path of extinction, but uh, okay, it's important to reflect upon it uh, by taking Yugoslavia as an example of <laughs> what's probably still going uh, wrong in the world. Uh, so uh, next uh, in line, uh, we have... Uh, Vedran Džihić. Uh, Vedran uh, is a senior fellow uh, at the Austrian Institute for International Affairs and a non-resident senior fellow at the Center for Transatlantic Relations, School of Advanced International Studies, John Hopkins University, Washington, D.C. Uh, 
Among other things, he is a very uh, well-known uh, professor uh, from Bosnia and Herzegovina, uh, even though he's not working in Bosnia and Herzegovina, like many of good professors that we have. But he's a distinguished and well-known scholar that's also uh, publicly quite involved. Uh, so I'm really happy that we have him here, and I would just like to give floor to him. Thank you so much for the nice in, uh, introduction. Uh, thank you all for uh, uh, digesting the food and uh, the former Yugoslavia with us. Uh, you know, the panels after the after the lunch are probably the most difficult uh, ones, and now you have to digest uh, two different uh, pieces of of of, of food: uh, history of Yugoslavia and and lasagne. Uh, from from the restaurant. Uh, I, before I start, I'm going to make five points. Uh, but first, I have to to go back to Ivana and ask uh, her uh, if uh, when she mentioned the United Europe as a project, united in differences or something. Uh, I, I was just curious if this is the motto of the Hungarian presidency of the EU Council or. Was it okay? No, you don't know. Okay, let's see. Let's see what happens. I mean, it, it starts on the first of July. No, but now on 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 serious terms. Uh, I think uh, uh, the first point is uh, uh, when you look back uh, at the country that existed. Uh, uh, the the first question that you probably uh, uh, get to ask yourself uh, is. Uh, from today's perspective, how real was what happened uh, for 45 years, actually. Uh, and this is, in the Yugoslav case, quite important as uh, following the dissolution of former Yugoslavia, uh, the national histories of the, of the, of the republics uh, that emerged after the, the divorce, uh, or at least many of them would try to portray uh, this period of 45 years as a lie. Uh, sometimes as a lie, like the Croats would do. So that was a, a horrific regime that basically neglected the rights of Croats. Uh, then some others will try to glorify it uh, on the other hand side and to keep up to the legacy of Tito. Uh, but actually, the, the, the looking back at what happened in former Yugoslavia, to take the lessons for today, uh, it was blurred, or it became blurred uh, through official history, through emotionalized uh, sentiments related to it. And from my eyes, like personal eyes, and even I was, at, I, mean, I was born in former Yugoslavia, and for me, uh, in a way, uh, if someone tells me that this is a lie, then the same person is telling me that I am a lie and, and, and not real because I, I was part of this, the, the, this, this period of 45 years. So actually, uh, that's interesting uh, experiment uh, at, at looking back at states or empires, uh, something that we, uh, we can uh, really take, take on board when looking into the history and asking the question, what, when can, what can we learn from the history? But uh, the, the more important question is basically, uh, uh, is the Yugoslav model. Uh, the Yugoslav model that uh, you partly referred to, and even in this piece uh, of, of paper, in this document, you basically find the remnants of something that was dreamt uh, to be a utopian uh, vision for a society which was not small in Europe, but also for the whole Europe. So basically, in this, I mean, in, in this model of, of, of socialism or in the model of a democratic socialism that was supposed to emerge uh, uh, through the reform of the Communist Party uh, 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 of, of Yugoslavia, uh, there was something utopian uh, uh, to it. And I think uh, uh, it's, it's important to look at, at previous utopia uh, or utopias uh, to learn actually for, for, for today's uh, uh, future horizons uh, in this particular case of Europe. And now when even I was quoting ecology and, and, and kind of, uh, uh, I mean, I, I made the joke about this united Europe and united inferences. I think it was the motto of the Austrian presidency of the EU Council uh, several years ago, united inference, et cetera, et cetera. So basically, we see some kind of uh, cycles that are repeating itself. Uh, and uh, uh, I think, uh, uh, in order to learn about the present, we need to look into the lived 
real utopias. I mean, it was a it was it was a modernization process. It was a real country with real people, uh, real languages, uh, uh, real political concepts, uh, and I think that's important to 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 underline. So my second point uh, uh, is about the wars. Uh, I mean, uh, I, I can remember because my father was part of the Communist Party and then I was politicized from the early ages, so reading all the newspapers and, and, and even though I was small, I, I in a way participated in all these debates. Uh, and I, I uh, remember late 80s or the beginning of 90s when the uh, Yugoslav dissolution started to evolve uh, after the 14th uh, Congress of the Communist Party uh, that was uh, shown on TV uh, and I remember my father and my mother sitting in front of the TV and watching it and I was also watching it, I was 14 at that age uh, and then when uh, the Croats and the Slovenes decided to leave the, the, the Congress uh, in January uh, I remember my mom just suddenly she was doing some washing machine or something, <laughs> but she she managed also to switch it switch it off later on, so we didn't need uh, to cut the energy uh, supply, electricity supply. But then she came back in the room and just said uh, to my father uh, in like panicking. So I think this is it. This is it. We need to we need to pack the luggage. We need to we need to leave. It's 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 you you don't understand it. And he started and again no oh, no it's just a, you know we will reform and there will be attempts etc etc. Uh, and but but my point here is actually that the war uh, never comes. Uh, uh, suddenly, just like uh, you flip the finger and, and, and the war starts. I mean, the war uh, uh, is announced. The war or the wars are made. They are made in documents. They are made uh, through ideology. They are uh, made or prepared by ideas. And when we now look at the Russian aggression against Ukraine in 2022, uh, now, I mean, obviously, ex posto, you are much wiser than you are <laughs> uh, before. Uh, but if you carefully ob observe basically what leads to a war, uh, the Yugoslav wars, but also now the Ukrainian, uh, the Russian aggression against Ukraine should be a warning uh, for uh, for what we see uh, on, on the European soil too. So basically, uh, uh, the point here will be uh, there is, uh, contrary to the belief of the 90s, there is no finality of the human history, uh, certainly no end of history, uh, but there is there are cycles uh, of, of moments, on sequences, on constellations that are repeating themselves sometimes, always in different shades, not, not the same one. Uh, but I think uh, it's important and it's, it's an important task for us researchers, the academics and intellectuals, to look into the patterns and try to understand. So this is my second point. The third point, six minutes and 42 seconds. Uh, the, the third point is about nationalism. Uh, and I think now, of course, following the uh, 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 elections for the European Parliament and uh, given the results of far right and looking to, uh, I mean, let's for this time not look to Budapest but look to Austria and what might happen in, in the elections, which I mentioned in, in the previous panel. Uh, but I think we can, we can easily conclude, and there are many scholars arguing that what happens today in Europe very much resembles some previous phases of, of European development. Like, I mean, some are going back to the 30s, and, and when, you, I mean, when Meloni came up, uh, uh, many of us read or reread again Umberto Eco's 14 points uh, uh, about fascism, uh, and now she's the pragmatic one, helping Ursula von der Leyen to form the commission, etc., uh, etc. Et uh, and I think uh, the, the interesting point here is, and this now going back to Yugoslavia, uh, that you always have a process of mainstreaming this type of nationalism and, and sentiments and attitudes. And I think when you look at the 80s or even some 70s in former Yugoslavia, you will, you will see this kind of a process of uh, the nationalist narratives uh, and that means exclusionary politics uh, and ideas that are basically engaging in othering uh, and blaming the other for whatever happens to me. Back then it was like Croats to be blamed for, I don't know, and then the Albanians to be blamed for the so-called demographic genocide in, in, in Kosovo and, and et cetera, et cetera. Uh, but basically these kind of uh, narratives, they tend to spread uh, and they tend uh, to be incorporated into the mainstream of political and public debates. And, 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 and this uh, uh, sometimes uh, becomes uh, even metaphysics 
of nationalism that, that, that translates into a public life, into public debates. And this kind of a metaphysics that, that uh, is assembled by narratives and discourses and, and fears, etc., etc., uh, that has a real political power and potential. Uh, and when I th look back at the, at the Milosevic metaphysics, but also Franjo Tudjman's metaphysics of, of, the, of, the, uh, of, the, of the 80s and early 90s, and when I compare it to, I don't know, some concepts in former Yugoslavia like Srpski Svet, uh, which is a metaphysics of a new Serbian nationalism or to Russian nationalism, etc., etc., uh, this is something that we, I think, needs, need to be aware. We should not forget uh, that uh, everything that is born in this world is not just going to disappear because we hope that this is going to disappear. So this the, the, the spread of far right nationalism right right now and today uh, is is something real. We should take care about that one. Uh, nine minutes and thirty seven seconds. No, my my last two points. Uh, but I uh, I mean when when we look at the uh, at the former Yugoslavia and then what what. Uh, uh, remains of the f former Yugoslavia. You look at this usual picture, and the usual picture says it's like uh, states confronting each other, uh, producing nationalisms and uh, revisionism, etc., etc. But I think it's important also to look. Uh, uh, on the margins uh, of this kind of a mainstream narratives, and on 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 one one important. Uh, additional or different narrative in former Yugoslavia that can also inform processes at the European level today uh, is an emergence and existence of something that in former Yugoslavia we call Yugospheres. So this is a sphere uh, of people and I, I, I'm, I, I'm happy to be to a certain extent part of it. I mean we are not nostalgic just for the sake of pure nostalgia. It's not about emotions, it's about the fact that in this part of Europe, and that goes can be extended to whole Europe, uh, there is a scene of cultural producers, researchers, activists, uh, and normal people uh, that do share the sense of togetherness. Uh, togetherness of culture, music, movie, jokes, bad jokes, good jokes. Uh, and, and if you wish, uh, a, a kind of a sense of, of universal togetherness that can be translated into the European context. So what is what makes Europe uh, whole, and what is what makes or what made Yugoslavia whole? And this kind of a Yugosphere uh, can inform a lot. And my last and final point, as I just have one more minute, uh, is about uh, uh, the, the one of the most important terms that the dissolution of Yugoslavia produced, that goes back to, to history and has historical roots, that's the term of Balkanization. Uh, uh, and I mean, uh, today even I uh, just I did a kind of a checkup before the, the lecture. So when you do a research, balkanization is commonly used in Economist, in CNN, in, in all possible. So it refers to a fragmentation of a society, to violence, to hatred, etc., etc. And that brings me uh, to, to to the point that we didn't mention uh, or, or managed to address in the first panel. This is the East and West, the construction of the East and West nowadays. Our have we managed to, to, to step over over the boundaries of East-West uh, uh, in the European Union? Do we still have the invisible or visible lines uh, and, and which parts uh, play Yugos plays, uh, Yugoslavia? And, and this kind of a bal uh, balkanization as a term just reminded me of the fact that we still do have a, a, a European Union uh, and a continent that pretends to be united, but that still is very much uh, 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 basically having a dividing line, an invisible or visible dividing line. Uh, so you have West planning on one hand side when it comes to some Eastern partners or Eastern countries of the European Union, you know, to Ukraine, to the Western Balkans. You have a lot of Orientalism, post-colonial attitudes, etc., etc. At the same time, the East also tries to reinvent itself uh, uh, to bring itself into the game, into the play. So I think the big, big task is is uh, a front of us uh, uh, to, to, I mean, take historical lessons, and I just referred to a few of them, uh, compile them with, uh, into something new that really has a, a, a ideational potential to overcome uh, the boundaries that we have still until today between the East and the West and, and create a kind of a common united Europe as a project united in differences, <laughs> to, to quote even again. Thank you very much, uh, Vedran. Um, I, I, I really appreciate uh, 
you bring again like uh, also your mom into the story <laughs> i think it made it much more alive uh, especially to me being an anthropologist uh, here uh, also to jody but also to ivana referring to her own history of being a yugoslav i was also born in yugoslavia actually even though uh, maybe i may look a bit yeah no no actually uh, maybe a bit later than you but also it was still yugoslavia <laughs> But I didn't grow up as a Yugoslav. Maybe two of you did, I didn't. Uh, I grew up in a complete ethnic identity. Uh, so I was born in 89, so this was uh, towards the end of it. Uh, so it was a very much a different time. Uh, but uh, I, I really appreciate the notion of, uh, you know, cyclical history that you kind of bring, that kind of things that come kind of repeating themselves and that we sometimes ignore in our kind of uh, view of progressive history that may seem mar much more real in 2012 when Europe seemed to be winning everything and now the situation is completely different and we seem to be living once again at the end of time. So really thanks so much for this like important lessons that we should be taking you know attention to uh, and uh, now i will uh, introduce our last speaker of today uh, who is the only speaker that i do not that i didn't know until today and which makes me much more excited to hear what you uh, have to say uh, but also please let me introduce you uh, to others so i will uh, introduce Cl claudiana beshku uh, who is associate professor at the department of political science faculty of social sciences at the university of tirana uh, so, uh, Claudiana teaches uh, geopolitics, European integration of the Western Balkans and social movements. She was also a visiting fellow at Scuola Normale Superiore and Jean Monnet fellow at the Robert Schumann Center of Advanced Studies at Euro European University Institute. So her PhD thesis was on the topic of today, which was the dissolution of Yugoslavia. Thank you, Igor. I was not born in Yugoslavia, so <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> I was born in Albania, but we also look to the former Yugoslavia with a certain sympathy. Because uh, differently from uh, Tito's regime, we have had like a harsh uh, communi communist regime in our country. So this third way of communism was even perceived by our side as something very special. So I think we share this in common. Up to Tito, because after the Tito's death, everything uh, was changed. And um, now I want to take you in another uh, direction. I would like to focus into the role of the European Union into this, uh, the dissolution of uh, former Yugoslavia. And uh, I'll, I'll drive uh, this panel to a more geopolitical context. So I would invite you to uh, imagine the EU, at that time it was European Community, EC, uh, as a geopolitical actor and see what has changed into the EU's behavior of that time with the EU's behavior in other conflicts or crises. Uh, so I'll try, meanwhile I go, um, how can I change the, uh, just to be at least here. Okay, just thank you. So I'd go uh, for um, I go I'd start from the from the beginning of the of the 90s. Uh, try to and, and, and do a bit of comparison with, uh, for example, with the um, EU's response uh, into the um, war in Ukraine. So the main um, question of my contribution would be. Is it the EU's role in the dissolution of ex Yugoslavia an underestimated or an overestimated contribution? I think it rather depends on how uh, what, what we were expecting from the EC or e the EU at the time. If we were expecting a lot, we could say that it was underestimated. If not, we could say the opposite. So it's like the joke with the with the half uh, half of the glass, how an optimist and how a pessimist see it. But let's go more in detail. The main uh, contribution of the EU in the in those years it is that it has re acted exactly as a soft power, and it uh, managed to equalize people and entity of a state, to put them in the same level, and we will see how this can affect, or it could affect, uh, if, 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 the, the, uh, if the countries of the, 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 the emerging republics of that time could have gone in this way, maybe some of the conflicts that we know could have been avoided. But um, it's interesting to see how this theoretical framework can be applied even in other conflicts uh, and current conflicts uh, too. Uh, 
Um, just to go back very shortly mm, to that uh, time, because I don't want to be repetitive, other uh, colleagues, distinguished colleagues uh, said that, uh, we had to do with some internal limits and with some external limits of the EC and um, of, of that time. Uh, what we have to do, uh, what we have to recall is that uh, the EC oper uh, operationalized through the European Political Cooperation Framework, the EPC of that time. The principle of, which was m mostly symbolic and very, uh, it was based on a moral responsibility between, between the, 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 the member states of the time. The principle of, un of unanimity uh, would be only introduced with the summit of Maastricht. So from that we can imagine how hard it was to take like common decisions within the EC of that time. On this, on the on the same time, we have we have to we had to do with the paradox. While Germany discussed its unity, the EC had to deal with the, with the dissolution. So in uh, diplomatic terms, both the EC and the EU did. I, I'm I'm using the terms um, interchangeably was that it was a, avoided to use the term disaggregation, split, tear off, etc. And it went for this uh, term of dissolution, which really gave the idea that new republics were emerging from, from, the, uh, from the situation. Um, so we, we have uh, this paradox where the, the, the same idea of self-determination was creating disaggregation in some territories of the EU and integration in, Ger in Germany, in some territories of the EU and abroad. I mean, it was uh, the Russian uh, dissolution also of that time. Uh, also, we, have, we had some external limits by that time in 1993. Uh, we have the war in, in, uh, in Kuwait. Uh, we have also, um, uh, and th there was a discrepancy between France and, 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 um, and Great Britain by that time. Uh, we had uh, troubles and turmoils in Albania, in Bulgaria, and Romania. Uh, so in Russia, we had this coup d'état. In Kosovo, uh, also we had protests, and uh, maybe it was the first country to 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 to, uh, to um, ask for this Kosovo rep Republic. I mean, for for its independence. Although most scholars go uh, with the idea that, uh, firstly, uh, the uh, the ideas of dissolution uh, came by Slovenia and Croatia, but this has to be discussed. So, uh, in this, uh, what what we see here is that even at that time there were many uh, crises that made EU act or non-act in a certain way. What the EU uh, exposed or brought to the region was uh, these two doctrines. The uti possidetis, so the non-changing of the borders with, uh, with force, and the self-determination doctrine. Uh, from, this, uh, from the clash of these uh, two uh, doctrines, we can say that uh, the EU, or the EC at that time, managed to root or to anchor the principle of the safeguard of the minority rights in our region. And we will see then, ever, even after, and we see also in the uh, EU Commission report how important the rights of the minorities are. And uh, we have, uh, as an illustration of this example, the new constitution of Kosovo, that where the, 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 the safeguard of the minority are, uh, rights is one of its pillars. So, uh, what we saw, what, what, uh, what the EC brought, or the EU brought at that time, was the fact that the rights of people were equal to the rights of community. Maybe uh, there is a, a, a very interesting study of Alain Pellet, uh, French uh, jurist constitutionalist, uh, that says that if we equalize uh, people with community in a country, then maybe we can avoid many, many conflicts as you see them uh, mentioned here. Um, at that time, uh, the EU also contributed with two declarations that were very ahead uh, by the time, also as we saw in the declaration of the Communist League. Uh, what we see here is that theoretically or formally, we have these um, very avant-garde declarations, uh, but maybe uh, the, 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 the issue was to implement them in the reality. 
So in these declarations, we see that uh, all the human rights were implemented. Uh, the Helsinki Declaration of 1975 uh, was, um, was taken as a point of reference because it was the only declaration in which all the Balkan countries and the EU countries uh, were under the same umbrella, I mean. So, um, in the second declaration, uh, all the republics of the ex yugoslavia were invited to present a demand for the recognition with the 23rd of December 1991, and uh, with all the hesitations of the EU by that time to, uh, to, to, to defend uh, the, the, the dissolution of, of Yugoslavia, to be, against, to, to be pro it, uh, what we see here is that everything, uh, when implemented to the ground, went in another direction. So we will see that the republics that managed to handle the demand in time uh, were Slovenia, Croatia, Macedonia, and Bosnia-Herzegovina. Uh, and only the first three, so uh, only Slovenia, Croatia, and Macedonia, were uh, recognized immediately in the next month from the member states and the European community, oh, with the case of, of uh, although it was demanded to Croatia to do a reservation, uh, to, to do uh, like um, a declaration in relation to the rights of minorities, um, this, was, this did not happen with Bosnia and, uh, and Herzegovina and also with Kosovo. The Kosovo's independence was refused in the Arbitrage Commission opinion in respect of the Uti Posidetis principle. Um, as we know here, I, I'm not going to stop uh, because you already know the story, but what we see here is that the EC and the EU was not really very, um, how to say, cohesive. Sometimes it perceived some of the republics, so sometimes it used some principles uh, to, towards a, a former republic in a way, and some, uh, sometimes it did not use the same principle to the other republics. For example, we have here the case of uh, fear of Macedonia at that time, which, which was composed by nearly 25 of Albanians, and to whom the condition of asking also the Albanians was not imposed by the EU as it was imposed to the Bosnia and Herzegovina. So, Germany and Austria would be the first states to publicly recognize the independence of Slovenia and Croatia in 1991. And this is something that I have, um, I have found in the uh, historical archives of the European Union. Uh, maybe it has not been a lot mentioned. In order to reassure the success of the reunion, it was the councillor call who guaranteed that the council was not going to discuss on the Yugoslavian issue, which had monopolized the reunion of the last unit, on condition to allow the recognition of Slovenia and Croatia within the next week to come. So as we see here, something uh, very similar to our days is that if France, geopolitically saying, if France or Germany decides to do to to to, to take a, a, de a decision or to to, to 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 throw all the EU in a certain direction, somehow it manage it manages to do to do that. So, from one hand, we have some solid contributions from the EC and the EU part, the Badinter Commission, which gave those important contribution because it uh, builded the. The, the, the juridical framework in which all the recognition of the former Yugoslavia would have been based. Uh, we had the use of the Helsinki chart, etc. And then, then we have a lot of contributions um, like the Owen Owen plan, Owen Schultenberg plan, etc. What is important is the fact that even with, the, for example, let's, let's take um, the, uh, the, the end of the war in, in Bosnia, the Dayton's agreements were really very similar to Owen Stoltenberg plan. What changed was that with the Dayton agreement, US entered in, in the play, and uh, the EU alone could not be able to do that, to, to act as a hard power. It only acted as a, as, a, as a soft power. So in this regard, what we see at the beginning of the 90s, maybe uh, making like a large uh, comparison to how the EU acted in front of the war in Ukraine, uh, at the beginning we had the same lack of cohesion between member states, then we had a lack of immediate answer by the EC EU to the situation on the ground as we had it in the when the Russian aggression started uh, in, uh, in, in Ukraine. Then, the lack of harmonization between soft power and hard power, maybe this is the 
the real case when the EU could have could have been more constructive and could have uh, op uh, collaborated uh, more with NATO. Uh, then we have this the same I, the, si the same situation. The EU is always overwhelmed by crises. Uh, we have passed, like in the EU, from multi-crisis to permanent crisis, and now there is a new concept that is called the crisisification of the policy making. Practically, it's uh, the fact that the EU sometimes makes some shortcut decisions in order to uh, to do uh, to mm, to uh, in order to uh, to prevent or to defend itself from the crisis. In that case, what can, what can we say? What are the lessons, if not that the EU never learns the lessons between, uh, between, uh, in front of an of of immediate crisis? Of course, uh, there are some similarities, although uh, the two situations uh, seem very different and are very uh, away in time. Thank you. Okay. Um, thank you very much, Claudiana, for making this very uh, direct comparisons between uh, what was happening uh, with Yugoslavia during that time and what may be happening uh, in Ukraine today as well with respect to the role of the EU as an entity that's made out of crisis uh, and an entity that never learns uh, its lessons. Uh, so uh, I would like now to... Obviously, first of all, thank the, all the participants of the panel really for keeping up with the time and making really meaningful contributions. And now I would open the floor to the audience and uh, I would first of all, I guess, collect questions that you may have and then I would give uh, back the word to the participants of the panel. Yes, please. Thank you very much. Uh, two questions, the uh, first to Ivana. Uh, it was very nice to see this declaration, but as I read it, it came into my mind it was at least five years too late. So uh, why did communists discover that they are not the right people and they're not the right way to lead a country only when the crisis was so imminent? And of course, I believe people lost their uh, confidence in the existing party structure. So in a way, uh, this could have been avoided uh, earlier, especially in the light what was rightly said, that the Yugoslav communism was, um, let's say, a lightweight communist compared to the other ones. Uh, the second question is uh, going to the last presentation. Uh, I believe you are rightly criticizing the European Union. I remember that Germany uh, almost prematurely recognized Croatia and overhand by other European countries which uh, quite reluctantly followed suit but was not planned uh, to recognize this republic so quickly. Uh, but uh, if we think of the European Union, I believe there are two things which worth to be discussed. One is, does the European Union know what it is and can act accordingly? or uh, it's prime, uh, in, in the meantime, uh, almost permanent crisis cripples its political uh, action uh, ability. Thank you very much, Janus. Now I will give also the word to Rubin, and then uh, inference also. Thank you, Igor. Actually, I am born in Yugoslavia, and I was grow up in Yugoslavia. <laughs> <laughs> and when was this? Um, in the Seventh Republic. <laughs> yeah, in the Seventh Republic. The Seventh Republic has been actually what he, uh, he said, the Yugosfera, that uh, the, the music, the culture, the sport is still alive, actually, because Yugoslavia has only six republic and the Seventh, uh, it's uh, the culture. For that reason, the, the most of, uh, I think, uh, uh, the Yugoslav people are still living in the uh, Seventh Republic. We won just an example three years ago, died one very famous cant author, George Vlasevic. And all the Yugoslav people actually were trouring for him and they went to Novi Sad there to, <laughs> to give the regrets and so on. Um, and not only Novi Sad, but all the, all the cities in Yugoslavia, in ex-Yugoslavia actually, they 
make commemoration for George Balashevich and so on. So that's a, that was the Seventh Republic of Yugoslav, Yugoslavia. Yes, uh, thank you for all of us. I read the Judy's uh, paper a little bit. Now even I didn't hear. Sorry, I was not present. Yeah, and the half of the, even us. Um, I'm anthropologist also, and uh, we also had one conference on the 30 year of the solution of Yugoslavia in Skopje, one international conference. We discussed it, what were actually the factors of the solution. Too many theories, too many <laughs> ideologies and so on for me and what will be the lessons for the European Union maybe that's the question of the panel I think that the, 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 the main uh, uh, problem was the economic disbalance of the republics Slovenia and Croatia were too rich and Kosovo and Macedonia and Montenegro were too poor and Slovenia and Croatia they gave money for Macedonia and for Kosovo and that was the revolt actually in Slovenia, in Croatia, that they said in the 80s, we're not giving any more money <laughs> for that. Uh, that's the second, uh, and that they started, even that I think it started much more before. We, we has have, have the, the history of the, the previous, the Kingdom of Yugoslavia, they also has a lot of problems that were, uh, not to say, transferred to the Titus Yugoslavia and, and later. The second issue, anthropologically, sociologically, is very important. There was never built Yugoslav identity as a nation. It was always built uh, national national identities, Croats, Slovaks, Macedonians. In the time when Yugoslavia was dissolved, only two million people declared it as Yugoslavs. Even they had more than five million marriages, intermarriages, and so on. So I think today we have in Europe we a very small number of the people declaring first they are put in the European identity, and second. Uh, no, no, it's opposite. They are putting the German, France, and the Spanish identity and European identities in the second priority. This is maybe one of the lessons that we have to, to see. Uh, what is also, I, th I think, that the impression that uh, during the Yugoslavia, they neglected neglect the, the religious factor in Yugoslavia. Uh, even they were under, under the carpet, the churches are very influential under the carpet and actually the nationalistic was the nationalists were actually um, acting through the, the religious institution and um, I think uh, that was not uh, uh, started in 80s who said somebody in 80s started I think that uh, it started in 1966 when it was the sixth congress of the communist party and when for the first time Tito said I'm a Croat, <laughs> and they started the nationalism actually. And uh, in that uh, Congress, they bring the, uh, the the solution of we call it I don't know how to translate it in English, Federiranje Federacije, <laughs> Spring of the Federation actually. So they decentralized the authorities of the Republic, and uh, to I have one. Um, remark about the Balkanization. Balkanization is not the process that started in the Yugoslavia and it's not from Yugoslavia. Balkanization is a term that started after the First World War and was inputted by the by the Europeans <laughs> to the to the Balkan people. Yeah. Thank you. I try I try yes. I try to be 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 be, be short. It's not easy because it uh, this panel is so rich. Um, in terms of content, and it's very important, I think, for, for, for historians and philosophers and sociologists and economists uh, to understand why it was such a dramatic um, and tragic moment and change um, for, those, for those of us who lived and worked and, and, and kind of fighting against totalitarianism in East and Central Europe. Because that was a, a, a prevailing paradigm, you know, the, the um, bipolar word, and and up until the end of eighty nine or mid eighty nine, basically nobody wanted to believe except of a, a handful of people that this is going to be changed. Yeah, it was so strong; it was a paradigm. Uh, it was a forced military agreement or compromise between U.S. and the Soviet Union to could rule and conduct the world. Um, together uh, with pro proxy wars. And nobody except of a 
a few thousand people, there may be tens of thousands of people in Eastern and Central Europe, um, and Western Europe, we believed from the early 80s that it is possible to change. I was ridiculed when I went to the US, uh, <laughs> we met with Jody in March or, or February, March, I gave some seminars about Berkeley University, about changes coming in Eastern Europe. And, and they were, it was, it was first academic and cultural shock. Uh, the, the after my first speech, they then had a stipendium there. The head of the radio, Free Europe, from Great Britain, invited me for a lunch at that ferry. I really appreciate your efforts, but be very careful. We are, the Russian tanks will come, and we are not going to help you. Again, we are leave, we're going to leave you in shit. So this is what they believed, and the opposite happened. Yeah, That's what we thought that... The opposite is happening, so a peaceful, step-by-step -step integration, a benign or, or civil um, empire paradigm was possible suddenly. And that was based upon European values. We started to discuss, we could not, we, it's not possible to finish the discussion about it. It was an East-West dialogue for years. It, uh, there was an East-East dialogue. After the 56 and 68, people understood that you have to avoid any means, any kind of um, violent revolution after 56. And it succeeded. And both, step by step, it was a miracle. And of course, we drew conclusions which were, now we can say, illusionary, that it can continue. And I absolutely agree with, with Veteran. Yes, nationalism and the nation state is. Um, metaphysical, it's partly illusionary, but what is not? Is Europe, European Union, it's, it's an imagination. And it, now, but there are certain moments in history when it looks like these, these images, these aspirations are becoming real. That was the moment from 87, 88, 89, 90. Gorbachev, Mitterrand, we, we talked about this. And then, um, then Yugoslavia. Yugoslavia was a, in Hungarian, Bezegorszag. They're the best example that socialism can work because they are a, a non-aligned country. They did much better economically. Um, we went uh, from Hungary to Yugoslavia as, as, as to, to Austria, almost doing shopping, yeah? shoes and whatever. Yeah? Uh, Gorenje and... and <laughs> So they were free to compare to, to the Eastern East Bloc countries, and they already applied to EU membership. And what year was that? Maybe 70? 1967, they were locked. 67, that's in 70. It doesn't matter. So long time before the war broke out, um, that was on the table of the European community, the application. Yeah? And everyone believed that that's very plausible. That's very, yes. Now, when it turned out, that, um, that Genscher and Gould decided, opted for, for the nation state paradigm, we were completely, could, we could not believe that. We could not, and it was never really discussed. Yeah, the Germany had a, uh, you know, it was a, a, a special case, it was a Sonderbeispiel, yeah? um, not naturlich, sind doch Deutschen, and that was the end of the dream. So the na nationalism and nation-state paradigm uh, replaced both the Cold War paradigm and, and this, this, this peaceful integration um, and Europeanization paradigm. And that, that was a shock. We got Jody and myself in July 17 and 18 in Belgrade. I just want to, I have a very, very strong memory of this meeting, uh, talking to Gera McMichnik, uh, all these people, whom um, some of them we met uh, before, but you know, risking, risking um, arresting, we went to see each other in Poland and Hungary and Czechoslo then Czechoslovakia. That was a fantastic thing, and that was a tragic thing at the same time. Uh, that we, nobody can do anything. We were dro driving back by car, and on purpose, I think, we went around a little bit towards Sarajevo, and it was empty, completely, it's like a dream completely empty um, highways. So no cars, can you imagine? And then I saw that a huge convoy uh, stopped the other way, stopped for gasoline. And I saw they were not in uniform yet. 
They were recruited. People with bald, bald heads shaved. And several times, that was so frightening that I never, never forget this. So this is how, how reality and your fantasy, your aspiration is, is in collision. And that uh, the other thing, which is very remarkable, that was never properly discussed, uh, that's not to blame the European, that was the community, and the, not to blame Germany, but to understand that that was a possibility which was missed. They could have, they could have said, stop it. We take, for, I mean, under certain condition, we take the entire Yugoslav um, set of republics, we, uh, you know, we, and it was not done, they opted for First, I think it was Croatia and Slovenia, and the, the nation state paradigm was back, and ever since it's here, and ever, we are suffering of that. So it's high time to start a new round table. Huh? Sean. Oh, oh, yes. uh, Sean, if, if you can just uh, wait for a little bit, because I would like to give a word to the panelists. I, I know that, Chaba, I also saw you, but firstly, I would just like to give the word to the panelists, maybe one round to them, and then we will go back to Chaba and Shah. Yeah? Okay. I'll just be very short. I mean, after that meeting in Belgrade, um, Ferenc and I traveled to the European Parliament, and we met, w we met with parliamentarians from every, every party, um, every party. And they all said that, we told them, you know, that there were ultimatums from all sides. If you don't do this, then there will be war. And they didn't believe us, okay? So they were completely unprepared. And um, I, 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 you know, uh, we, we told them, we gave them this um, alternative of accepting um, all of Yugoslavia in one, you know, in one group at that moment. Um, but then they said, would Hungary, Poland, and Czech Czechoslovakia um, sacrifice themselves for a later admission, you know? for to, to um, assuage the crisis in Yugoslavia. I just wanted to say too that, um, yeah, in 1967, Yugoslavia was at the top of the list for special status with the, with the European co um, community. And um, that um, all went down. So I wanted to really thank Claudiana for her presentation because um, you really touched on some important things. Um, one of the things that we noticed um, back then, but also recently, <laughs> is that these bureaucrats in, um, in Brussels are kind of living in a bubble and they don't really uh, know what's going on. And so they're not well informed and they're not really willing to be um, well informed. Um, the, ins the structural problem, I think, with the European Union is that the it does not anticipate. So what it tries to do is react. So uh, some crisis happens, something that could be anticipated because there is knowledge out there, but it's not, um, it's not taken uh, in hand in terms of formulating um, preventative policies, not just in the Yugoslav crisis, but as in the Ukra Ukraine crisis. So it always finds itself in a reactive mode. And I think that this reflects a kind of dysfunctional uh, thought process. It's a dis dysfunctional thinking. Um, that we are all kind of participating in and, and that um, now, especially with the social media and media, um, just promotes these, these, this non-thinking, you know, on issues that could be predicted. So I just wanted to make those comments. Just two, two quick takes. I think uh, when it comes to the causes and consequences of historical events, uh, we need to avoid any uh, oversimplification. So, I mean, of course, we, we, we tend to uh, uh, portray the world in black and white, but it, when it comes to the dissolution of Yugoslavia, it's, it's, it's really a kind of a complex set of, 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 of factors. Uh, and I, I think the, the, the most important notion is basically to face the complexity, but also to stick to the facts. Uh, and, and when you have here, like, again, geopolitics between myths and reality, uh, you can also take the dissolution of Yugoslavia as a, as a, as a question uh, uh, to distinguish between myths uh, uh, and, and facts and reality. Uh, and even more, why, I mean, why is this important? Uh, it is important because if you don't distinguish between myths uh, and reality and facts, you enter a vicious circle, uh, basically, where the, uh, where the myths come back uh, and show up uh, as, as, a, as a factual truth, uh, which is a not. So it, then, then we are in the middle of this kind of a post-factual debate, basically. Nowadays, when you look at discourses in Bosnia, in Serbia, but also when you look at the, at the explanation for, the, for the, uh, what is happening in Ukraine right now, you have uh, holistic explanations of the events based 
uh, on 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 myths and on non facts, and I think this 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 is this is quite important. And precisely when it comes to to the history of former Yugoslavia, as the former republics uh, today, independent states, all the time keep coming back. Uh, and the one underlined the Serbian nationalism, and then the Serbs will go on and underline the Slovenes and and Croats nationalism, and then the uh, one uh, that are now rather on this kind of uh, free market capitalist slash neoliberal trend, they will portray uh, the Yugoslav self management and the socialist uh, economic model as a, as a, as a utopian version that never worked out, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But I think we need to to, to to come uh, overcome it, and the second one, just referring to uh, to to what many of us uh, do, and I think there is a point in uh, constructively criticizing and looking into the European Union and its its, its pitfalls and uh, the un inability to react sometimes in a reactionary mode. But at the mm -hmm. same time, uh, I, I think we need to just take a small step back from this kind of uh, overemphasizing the crisis. I mean, crisis, crisis, crisis. I mean, when I, when I read like stuff from the 19th century, from the 50s, from the 60s, from the 70s, it was always this notion of crisis. I mean, the crisis is around us. I mean, crisis is what we do, what we make. I mean, it's, it's, it's one of the states of human mind and humankind. Uh, and I think we need also to distinguish here. I think when it comes to the EU, I think the EU overperformed. When it comes, to, when it when it comes to the reaction to the Russian aggression in Ukraine, so given the 27, how the EU organized the the, the first reactions, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, it was an overperformance. And now that uh, Ukraine, just two years later, is starting negotiations uh, and is probably more integrated with the European Union than the Western Balkans nowadays, is overperforming to a certain extent. It has utterly underperformed and, perf and failed in the case of Yugoslav dissolution. And for example, I mean, in, in geopolitical terms, it's underperforming. It's not visible when it comes to the conflict in the Middle East and the war in Gaza. So it's, it's totally not existent. So basically, I think, uh, again, a, a quest for differentiation and, and, and not to a simply oversimplifying this, uh, what sometimes uh, today needs to be an, in vogue, uh, EU bashing. Uh, uh, these are my two points. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, okay, I just wanted first to say in response to Janos' question, this is, uh, as Ferenc mentioned, the uh, uh, question of, of this dissolution of Yugoslavia is very complex and requires interdisciplinary, multidisciplinary approach and collaboration between different uh, researchers. And uh, Vedran warned us against uh, oversimplification. So I'm not going to even attempt of answering your question. <laughs> I'm just going to say that what I was looking for uh, in this declaration were the narratives about transnationalism. That was my personal uh, quest here. And I apologize, I never really uh, said where did I get the declaration from. So I found it in a pile of my father's uh, documents. Uh, he was uh, indeed a member of uh, Yugoslav Communist Party and he was uh, one of the important clerks there working with Slovenes and uh, uh, Croatians and uh, everybody except for Serbs in fact uh, on these declarations. And this declaration um, was not the only uh, document that was a, an attempt of collaboration among uh, communists to to save uh, Yugoslav project to reform it somehow. So this was this has been going on always. And uh, just a quick remark: uh, uh, Claudiana mentioned that, that uh, Kosovo was the first to actually raise the issue of of separation, and that is that is also mentioned in this declaration. And on top of all that, uh, in connection with this declaration, I have also found uh, my dad's unpublished manuscript. Uh, which which is his own um, uh, which is his own take on the dissolution of Yugoslavia from his own eyes, and in the beginning he mentions that it's based on on his memory, which can be deceiving, and that uh, uh, the story about the dissolution of Yugoslavia is a kind of a Rashomon because everybody has its own his his or her own uh, perspective, and uh, he gave his own. Uh, kind of uh, interpretation, which is very interesting. And I wanted to tell you that uh, as a part of saving the legacy of my father, I intend to publish it. So this is why I wanted today to talk about it. 
Um, and my own research is about uh, transnationalism in Yugoslavia and this question of identities. I think that Yugoslav transnational uh, identity was something that really isn't identity and like European Union as well. It's something that is uh, overcoming this level of nationalism and national identities. Like we, if, if we are on a higher level, maybe we can, maybe we, we don't have to pay so much attention to identity, but rather on how we can cooperate together. Uh, so yes, blame me for for uh, talking about utopias, but yes, that was exactly my <laughs> my my mission. So yeah, Claudiana, back to you. We need utopias to go ahead sometimes. Um, no, I, I just will go back in two points. Vedran and the professor here. I'm not dealing with everything. Uh, Vedran, we are on the same path. I mean, uh, of course, there is a like a, a lot of pressure or a lot of importance given to the crisis uh, in the EU. And I think uh, it's like a justification sometimes from the EU member states with the famous European fatigue. Every time that they have to, to take an important uh, decision, they uh, come and listen uh, the, cr the crisis that's going on in a, in the, in a time when the EU, EU is made of crisis. We are all on the same boat. Every country is dancing in the rain now, so maybe, uh, yes, that's, that's my point of view too, let alone this crisis, because we, we are in crisis and we were going to be uh, amidst crisis for a long time, so that could not be a justification anymore. And regarding of what Professor said, uh, I'll take only his uh, provocative uh, and very interesting question. Does the EU know what it is? Um, I was in Tetovo this Monday, like two, two days ago, and someone from the panel brought the exact question to me. Uh, she, at a, uh, she also, f she at a point uh, felt pity for me because I was studying an entity, which is EU, that does not know what it is. I th yeah, exactly. Um, uh, I believe that the EU knows perfectly what it is, what its interests are. I mean, the EU uh, taken in consideration as a, 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 a group of member states and where they want to arrive. So with this idea, they sometimes securitize some conflicts or some issues and do not securitize some others. What in my, uh, per, per, in my um, view is the problem is the, a discrepancy between the, an EU community of values and a Balkan, Western Balkan community of values. Uh, to illustrate my idea, I will only, give, uh, I'll only take uh, what I mentioned before, the minority rights. For the EU, it's, it comes so natural to defend minority rights in every country which is not so natural in our region. We still have to fight for minority rights of Serbs in Kosovo and of Kosovo of uh, Albanian uh, Kosovo Albanians in Serbia. So, I mean, this is this is the problem, and the, and the EU comes with a set of values, with security issues, and with economic um, with economic uh, support, and. Also, Elira mentioned it in, in the panel before. We cannot take only what we what is interesting for us, and let alone the others. And I, this I don't know why it came to my mind the the the, what the, the, the question of Henry Kissinger when he wanted to simplify the EU. He made that famous question, saying, uh, "Give me a number to call the EU. I don't know what the EU is. Give me a number." I think we come with these uh, questions every time that we want to sabotage the EU because it's not, uh, it's not that we don't understand it, but we, we are not in the mood of, of being part of the club, not in, the, in that moment, not yet ready. I don't know, uh, this is my, 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 my feeling. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, to the panelists for being so concise and not drifting away from the topic of discussion. Yeah, I thank very much to Chaba and Sean for being very patient. And now I will give first the word to Chaba. Yes. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I have a brief question to Vedran Jihic, uh, who talked about uh, nationalist metaphysics, uh, but perhaps uh, other panelists has have something to contribute to this. And uh, the question uh, concerns the nature of national identities uh, in, in the former Yugoslavia, because 
from from Hungarian point of view, uh, before uh, before 1990, uh, Yugoslavia seemed to be a, a very free society with with a uh, with with a cultural life uh, much more rich, uh, much richer than uh, than Hungarian one. Uh, and so it is somehow surprising how uh, these national identities could uh, intensify so terribly after the turn. So, so could, could you elaborate on, on, on that or could, could you specify some, some special characteristics of, of these national identities? Thanks. Thanks very much. Um, this is one of those framing questions, and it was triggered by something that Jodie said right at the beginning. She pointed out that Ernst Gelmer was present in the room at that particular time, and those of you who've read Notions and Nationalism will have a very clear sense of the significance of that observation in the context. So I'm gonna offer four provocative observations. One is stop imagining that the EU can solve crises. It wasn't created for that purpose. It hasn't been structured for that purpose. It doesn't have personnel who are trained for that purpose with the exception of a few people in the EAS. And it doesn't want to have to deal with crises. It wants to manage an integrated union of states that have met criteria and been admitted for that purpose. That's what it's there for. That's how it's structured. You know, have a look at the DGs. Have a look at the commissioner's responsibilities. There's no crisis management responsibility. And everybody knows that Borrell has probably the worst job in creation because there isn't really a common foreign and security policy. So don't waste time on it. It's very regrettable but it's not, the problem isn't going to be solved by the European Union, and the European Union will kick for touch every time it has the opportunity to do that because it isn't equipped to deal with crisis. It will simply increase the level of complexity within the institution to a level which is unacceptable. So it will deal with things on the periphery, and it will try to minimize the threats to its own institutional identity but it's not a crisis management institution. And f it is therefore very false, and I thought Martin made the point before lunch rather well. It's very false to remake the rules of the game to prioritize, Yugosla uh, sorry, to prioritize Ukraine and derivatively Moldova. Because those particular crises are the product of Russia's decision to go across the border into Ukraine and cannot be resolved by the European Union. They can only be resolved by entities like NATO, the OSCE, and so on. So putting pressure on the EU to accelerate the admission of Ukraine and derivatively Moldova and marginalize the Western Balkans who've been in the waiting room for rather a long time is a completely idiotic pattern of behavior. But that's what we do. And that takes me to the myth versus fact issue that Vedam was raising. And, and the only thing that I'd qualify in respect of that is that there's a, forgive me for being flippant, and I don't mean to be, it's shorthand, but one man's myth is another man's fact and vice versa. And that's the problem. The problem is that getting to grips with a common definition of what constitute the facts of a particular circumstance in a complex environment with a wide variety of perceive, perceivers who are also political decision makers is extraordinarily difficult. You have to devote an enormous amount of effort to achieving that. I'm not gonna go back to the Thomists and the Scholastics who argued that objective truth is only accessible to the deity and the rest of us have to deal with subjective truth, but there's a certain element of truth in that, of course, as well. And then I guess I, I'd like to uh, come back. I, I had to deal with Iraq in the aftermath of Yugoslavia blowing up. And to anyone who understood something of why 
what had happened in Yugoslavia had happened. It was quite obvious that was going to happen in Iraq. There was a certain set of circumstances that had enabled the survival for a period of time of slightly artificial polities, wonderfully artificial polities, but slightly artificial polities. And there was rising nationalism, rising cultural identity, whichever way one wants to describe it, in both environments. And the strong man, who had exercised a measure of sophisticated control in the context of Tito, and brute force in the context of Saddam Hussein, was no longer on the scene. So fragmentation was almost inevitable. But to motivate for and mobilize in support of that fracturing, you need myths. And of course what happened in Yugoslavia was myths that went back to the 12th, 13th, 14th century, which were romanticized in the 19th century, were deployed at scale right across the whole of the landscape. But what I'm, the, 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 I want to circle back to, to, to Jody's point. What did Gelmer have to say about this? Because Gelmer's thesis, as you know very well, you didn't do the five points, but you know very well, is essentially the coextensiveness of national identity and territory. That's the sort of underlying thesis of, of, of Gelmer. So what, what was he arguing in that framework? Because I assume our purpose in discussing this is to learn the lessons that we can learn and think about how we might be able to address it. And I'm searching for lessons. Sorry, I'm selfish, but I cannot manage not to react to what you said. It's, it's yes and what you said, yes and no. You, the EU is not only, it, is, it can be seen as a, as a bureaucratic machinery, as you described. At the same time, it does have, a, did have, as a European community and the European Union, an aspiration to play a role globally as a peace process, a peace project. And Europe as a peace and to prevent war within and around its borders. It does. It did have a chance to prevent the war in Yugoslavia. That that and because because history knocked on the, maybe the bureaucrats believed nobody believed not not, not only the, not in the United States in Europe nothing will change. In eighty nine, that was com they were completely surprised, but they had to react. Mitterrand reacted in one way, and Kohl reacted in a completely different way. And these two um, were paradoxical, and we are living still in these this paradoxes. It was a chance to avoid the war in Yugoslavia. They could have decided so. And they did. I mean, <laughs> for example, Genscher, uh, Kohl, and Mitterrand. And that was, there, were, there were talks about, there were, there were yeah, promises with, there were, pro you. sorry, there were, there were, there were agreements with, 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 with Gorbachev. Yeah, they could have. Yeah. It wasn't shared by the hmm. That's the problem. The problem is when a crisis hits you or when a crisis is looming in front of you, getting agreement even among 12 or among 15 <laughs> is very yes. difficult. Getting agreement among 27. When the crisis hit, nationalism came out, out of this you know, thin, thin <laughs> layer of, of a transnational integration. That's the problem. That was not deep enough. The integration, a lot of ideology, a lot of fantasy, metaphysics. They, many people believed, ah, yeah, we are creating a peaceful, everyone can be a member. And then there was a chance, we screwed it. So that's it. We, we are here. One second, because uh, one of our panelists has to leave very soon. He has some well, obligations. The reality is, 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 is getting, to, getting to me, so I have to pick up my kids <laughs> from the school. So. <laughs> this is a fact. <laughs> this is a fact. <laughs> <laughs> um, we have to finish anyway, so I will just give a uh, quick word to all of the panelists here. First of all, maybe to Jody, or would you like to? Well, I don't know how much more I can comment on it. I mean, wh what Gellner did was um, he he categorized four time zones in Europe. Um, the first he called the Atlantic Sea Coast um, of Europe, that consisted of strong dynastic states which coexist with cultures. And then he said the only exception to that was Ireland, of course. Um, the second time zone included Italy and Germany that already had developed a high culture. And all that was needed was to endow um, well-established cultures with a kind of political roof. 
Um, he said there was no need to create a culture for the peasants to identify with. And he said the third time zone, um, in the third time zone, all of the stages of nationalism, nationalism have been played out. Um, the fourth time zone, he said, shared the fate of time zone three up until the 1920s. And then national so and then he concluded that national um, self determination was rubbish because it just meant the exclusion of of one over over another. So that was pretty much what he what he said. Yeah. No, uh, as, as I said, I mean the reality is now clashing on me. Uh, and uh, what, what you just said, I need to, to comment with a quick sentence. I mean, the, the one 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 person's myth is the other person's reality. Uh, it it might be true in the post factual era, but I, I think as if we go back to 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 Kant's uh, or I mean not the rationality assumption or, or even Habermasian kind of a rational public uh, uh, moment. I, I think we do have a almost a quest for a new enlightenment today, uh, which will then uh, include actually the, the the very strict kind of uh, dissecting the the myths from reality. I mean, uh, let's take the example of Srebrenica. I mean, there is a facts: eight thousand one hundred seventy-five people were killed. Uh, Serbia just went to the general assembly to claim that. This simply did not happen. So this is actually this kind of a clash between one person's myth is the other person's reality. But I think uh, uh, there is factual truth, uh, uh, and there is a truth based on opinions and uh, of, of of a group of us. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. 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 Let me take an example And and the Ga 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 Gaza effect. No, I mean this is the, the the question that you're asking is basically how do we find political tools and methods to deal with that? I mean the effects of it are. are are, are real in a way and blurring the, the, the lines, but in a kind of a, uh, uh, if if we wanna if we wanna keep or work uh, on 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 living this European Union as a kind of a vision for the future that is not now just you know gonna die and we wanna fight for it. I think we need to find ways how to dissect it and and, and, and differentiate. Uh, anyway, this this is and, and on the national, I mean, it, this is a huge issue and I uh, published a, a bit on it and. Uh, I don't think that that we have time to to go into details, but I think uh, uh, it's quite important that the 19th century and and actually the the reinvention of or modern uh, birth of nations in in former Yugoslavia. I mean, at that time it happened in many other parts of Europe. Uh, worked uh, very much with a kind of a reinvention of history. I mean, if when when Serbs would go to 1389 and to the myth of Kosovo and claim that there were Serbs, but there were no Serbs, as there was no modern state, as Gelna would claim. Uh, or in Bosniaks would claim uh, stick to the medieval Bosnian church here. I think uh, so. This this is basically uh, a process that happened in the 19th century. It became a pillar of national identities in former Yugoslavia. Uh, and then a, a point that I, I think is important. I mean, that was uh, Anderson's uh, imagined communities, imagined uh, based on you know past, imagined past, blood, whatever. Uh, but then Tito's experiment was quite an interesting one. I mean, someone just mentioned Yugoslavs and that, uh, that was a lie and etc. etc. But what he actually uh, tried to do is, uh, I mean, from the socialist ideological background to, and certainly with repressive means and tools, uh, to try to create a new imagined community. Uh, uh, he certainly failed, but he also did not fail. To I mean, when, when I look at Igor and he comes from Mostar, uh, and in Mosta is, is one of the cities where uh, the majority of so-called uh, mixed marriages, I mean, this is a euphemism, there are no mixed marriages. I mean, we are all mixed as we meet and hug and start kissing each other uh, because we are many, we are not one. I mean, we can also kiss each uh, ourselves, uh, but this is not a futile exercise. And and basically, you know, I mean, I'm 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 a product of uh, of of of. I mean, my my father was a communist. Uh, my mother was a communist. She's from a Ukrainian or origin, uh, Ukrainian roots. My father has Muslim roots, but both of them atheists, of course, obviously. And what I am, am I a illusion? Uh, uh, basically. 
Yeah, I'm a minority, yeah. But, but, but the point is, and, and the crucial moment comes basically when this flips again into this kind of a hostile uh, uh, othering. And I think what is important here to see there's a political strategy to a certain extent. I mean, the, the mobilization of differences, uh, you always can take the way of mobilization of differences for the sake of whatever, economic interests, political interests, power interests, or you can go uh, into something which is transcending the, the differences what the European Union has been trying since, since this establishment. And I think what's happened in the 90s or in the 80s was this kind of uh, discovering the nations and, and stories for, for political purposes. And I think this, this is something that we need, 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 need to underline. And that creates, of course, facts. I mean, people killed in Bosnia or in Kosovo or somewhere now, people killed in Ukraine, these are facts. I mean, this is a human being killed on, uh, on, on, the, on, on, on the assumption of, of, of this othering, actually. Of but I mean, as I have to run soon, uh, I just wanted to say it was it was such an inspiring I inspiring day and an inspiring discussion, and I hand over to Ivana to listen to the last two contributions, and then I run. Oh, okay. No, I don't have a contribution. Actually, I just wanted to thank first of all Jody, who who thought that we should do this panel. It was her idea, and uh, her document was the inspiration also for me to pull out this declaration, and also uh, for for Vedran to invite Vedran. And thank you so much for for everyone. Thank you, Vedran, for coming. Thank you, Igor, for being the perfect chair with clinging. And uh, thank you for Claudiana for coming, and thank you, Elira, for inviting uh, for inviting Claudiana. Thank you, Sean, for commenting. Thank you. Ferenc, thank you, Rubin, thank you, Janos, thank you, everyone. I'm really happy that we had this. Uh, <laughs> yes, I'm really happy that we had this panel. You're get out of time. <laughs> Just a very short remark. Uh, yeah, of course, after, after all these thanks, but that'll be very short. Of course, uh, EU is not equipped to solve crises because EU does not create crises itself. We have US for that. <laughs> so, <laughs> but this is where the strength of Europe stands, and this is why it is a pole, a pole of attraction for our countries, in the same level as the US is. Uh, because we are arguing maybe how to make it be more effective in responding to crisis, on how to cre or how to create a more a proactive or constructive environment in the way of, uh, of this crisis not to happen. This is what I, I, I think we were ar uh, arguing and discussing about. And uh, this is the, 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 the very strong point of, of, of the EU. So thank you for bringing me here. It was really a pleasure to, to, to embark in these discussions and in such uh, interest, interesting point of views and perspectives. Thank you. <laughs>